Alrighty. I've been watching a bit of stuff uh, recently on YouTube. I had heard that China was going to have problems or might overheat its economy and everybody was talking about a Chinese collapse. Yabba, 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 yabba. Anyway, I sort of hadn't looked into it too much and thought, ah, I think it's a load of crap. But there was a 58-minute documentary made by the BBC on this and there I was watching different stuff one night, probably a bit of Troy's stuff or something, and I thought, oh, we'll have a look at this. So I had a look at it and I'm going to summarise some of the things that are going on over in China and why they've occurred and why that... Yeah, I do believe there might be real troubles on the way. Uh, and I've heard about this 2016 collapse and this chance 2016 uh, or 2017 or <laughs> these things usually string out, so it could be 2018. Um, you know, there might be some real troubles. Uh, hopefully by then I'll have this place paid off and I won't be living in a glorious house, but I won't be in debt either, so that all sort of... Um, be a bit of a relief. Ugh, wood stove's blowing smoke at me. I've got to close the door here. Um, anyways, quite simply, it's like this. In the States, they obviously had the GFC and the collapse occurred. Now, in all that, China being such a country that's dependent on exports, suddenly wasn't having its exports being bought they were stockpiling their warehouses full of the stuff they'd made. They had U.S. warehouses full of it. And nobody was buying it in the States or Europe or here because everybody was so tight because they were more concerned about being able to cover their mortgage and they were starting to be very conservative with, with the money they did have because of fear of losing their job. Um, now, you've got to understand something about China. It's not a democracy, and basically, in 1988, they some people wanted the system to change pretty much to a democracy. Um, now, that element still exists there, and although it's not widely shown, it still exists. Um, and basically, what is keeping the government dictatorship in power um, is quite simply money. Now, by this I don't mean they've got enough money to keep pushing the population around. What I mean is they've been growing consistently and very quickly for the last 30 years. As a result, everybody's sort of kept happy by the fact there's money in the place. They've all got jobs. Boom, boom, boom. Now, all of a sudden, that dried up very quickly after the GFC. And what they done after they filled all their warehouses up and whatnot and the sales are slowing right up, they thought, well, we can't just keep making this stuff because no one's buying it. So they went and sacked all these workers. Now, the workers really cracked the shits because their only alternative was to go back and become peasant farmers as they had been before. My nose is getting blocked here, just give me a second. Now, it's sort of unusual um, for this to happen, but there were a lot of protests in China by these workers about losing their jobs and having to go back to the rice paddies or whatever. Um, you know, back as peasant farmers that were battling to make it along. Um, and... It seems, and this has become very apparent in a book I've been reading lately called End of Empire, um, written in the, I don't know, early 90s or late 80s or something, um, about the end of the British Empire. And there's bits I've read about different countries who become independent, and they basically wanted the British out. Um, but when the British went, Egypt, Arden, which became uh, the People's Republic of Yemen and uh, now I think it's just plain Yemen or South Yemen or something like that. Um, when they went, a lot of the time, these great big military bases 
such as Egypt and what was Arden, um, closed. And that was a massive income for the population. So they wanted the independence, and they got it, and they lost these massive military bases with it. In Egypt, the British had this place that was the size of Wales that they could train off. There were so many soldiers that they had in, in Egypt that, you know, one big business was the laundry business, just washing uniforms. Arden had a massive port that they used to sort of, you know, restock their supplies after coming from India or whatever to re, you know, stock the ship with food or whatever before they went through the Suez Canal, the Mediterranean and through to England. Um, and they lost all that with their independence. Same with the Anglo-Iranian Oil Company. Um, you know, when they decided they wanted to nationalise it, um, the British basically more or less went on strike or, you know, disassembled and screwed up some things so that things wouldn't work. Um, and, you know, all of a sudden they lost their oil export money. But the people still had this expectation of, this is our living standards now, we don't want them to drop, they should only go higher. Uh, you know, and that in people's lives in general is one of the things that drives people into massive debt and they seem to be getting deeper into debt and not coming out of it is because they don't want to alter their living standard. But this happens to entire populations. And this was sort of what happened with these Chinese protests. And they sort of feared a bit of a revolution. So the only way to stave all that off was to say, well, let's have a bailout. And Hank Paulson was on that uh, documentary saying that, you know, we knew they'd have some sort of a bailout, but it ended up being something like 20 times the size of what we thought it was, and maybe even 40 times the size of what we expected. They said it was so astronomical, it was hard to even get a grip on what it was. Now, what happened was they went in ahead and they said, oh, well, you know, there's not much work in the factories, but what we can do is we can build up China. Let's modernise our cities because we're going to become, you know, a first world country and we're developing and, and let's make ourselves look good. Um, you know, so what we should do is build these uh, apartment buildings and this and that and, you know, the state government and the local government all got on board. Oh, let's go ahead and, and do this. And they got everybody a job in construction. And it's got all the hallmarks of the same property bubble in the States that has occurred, you know, and collapsed in 2008. Um, now, yeah, what they went ahead and done was they built a lot of these different places, um, apartment buildings, um, stadiums and whatnot. Now, I'll tell you something. These people are on something like $2,700 to $4,000 a year. So they build all these apartments. Great, they can move into these apartments. Hold your horses. What's the cost of these apartments? Try around $300,000. For the richer end of town, $500,000. But don't think you're going to get one for $20,000 or even $50,000. It's not even 100000 It's not going to happen. And they talked to one bloke and he said, 50 years of work and I still couldn't pay for it. You know, so we're not moving into these places. So it's ironic that a lot of the people that build these places are not in these places. Furthermore, very interesting. You know how we get 10% deposit here? And then the bank will give you, you know, 80% or 90% um, or whatever and cover the rest after you've paid for the deposit. You know what it is over there? It's not 10% down payment, it's 70% down payment. Yeah, 70%. And then I think you've got to basically pay it off to the building developer, not the bank, or maybe to a bank. Um, but, you know, 70% down payment of $300,000 each, it, it's not practical. Uh, some of these, you know, Chinese on average are saving one third of their income. Now, I don't know if that's your, your middle class or your lower class or what. Um, you know, it may be that these lower class people have barely got anything left to, uh, to be able to save. 
Um, but in all this, there's some people who are making massive dollars out of all this. Uh, and it's the same as the states, I think, in the respect that when they build these apartment buildings, they're valued at $300,000. It doesn't matter that they can't sell them for that. But all of a sudden, they built them for bugger all, and now they're valued at $300,000 so they can use the equity to jump into the next project and fund their next project, um, you know, and, you know, give themselves a big line of credit and all this sort of stuff, you know, that allows these people to go driving around in, in you know, real posh cars and, and, and whatnot. Um, and basically... The way it works a lot of the time is these developers are making a killing, but so are the local officials. And the local officials get a bribe from the developers to make it all go smoothly, to make nobody argue the toss or put in you know, any opposition, to make all the forms, the astronomical amount of forms just go smoothly. They pay the developers, uh, the developers pay them a bribe. But on top of that, because they're local government officials, they can do something which is probably much the same as what we have over here called compulsory acquisition, where they can just basically grab your damn land off you for the use of building something with public works on it. And this has happened down to somebody down here in the capital. They said, we want to build, bulldoze your house and put a whole bunch of pipes in. Next door to him was a vacant block. They weren't interested in it. They didn't contact the owner about that. They didn't touch it. And it was only a bunch of pipes for bloody waterworks or sewerage or some bullshit. They wanted to knock his house down and leave the vacant block next door vacant. Uh, and they had compulsory acquisition on his place. And they basically probably do a similar thing um, to be able to get their hands on these farms. And they buy these farms forcibly and give them peanuts price, um, you know, for these farms. They can barely enough to buy another farm. Um, you know, they can probably get another farm, but they'd be getting a damn cheap um, or they couldn't get one as big as what they had on that price. And then they rake the price right up before they sell it to the same developer who's bribing them to make things go smoothly. Um, so there's too many vested interests in all this. Now, the trouble is that they, the central government, the feds, were alerted by this, by other American bankers and whatnot, saying that what you've got going on here looks so much like a property boom and it's all going to blow up in your face. Be very careful. Uh, you may want to put the brakes on. And they said, OK, we realise this is the case, so they tried to put the brakes on. That's when they had the credit crunch that I warned you about. Um, you know, and they they basically said to the banks, we said to you before, spend, you know, just go out and lend this money. Now we're saying things are getting out of hand. People ain't going to be able to pay this debt back. These things are overvalued. You've got to slow up. And so they just told them basically stop. And of course, there's too many other projects in the works for them to just stop. And there's too many vested interests involved in local government, in state government, in city governments. And there's an old saying, when the emperor's a thousand miles away and there's many mountains between us, well, they'll never know. So what they done was they created a shadow banking system. And this is basically, looks like a business that's not a bank. It's just a normal business. It could be whatever business they want to call it. Um, you know, it could be a blimmin' plastic bottle company. It could be whatever. But it's not a bank. And then they do things that look like sale transactions and all this. And basically they give out loans. And it may look as though this company is investing in, you know, the depositors might be blooming buying product and the company is going very well, so they're investing in stuff whereas they're actually making a loan. And all the books are cooked. But it goes on. And they know what the debts are in the official banking system, but almost overnight this shadow banking system was created to let the property boom continue um, and, you know, 
against the wishes of the feds, against the wishes of the central government. Um, and the gravy train's rolling on. And these places are dangerously out of control with debt. Uh, originally because of the communist government basically had 40% of GDP being invested into uh, helping the country grow. During the GFC they upped that to 50% and then before you knew it the debts were something like 1.25 fold, you know one and a quarter fold what the GDP was, the national GDP was per year. Now it's double that and things are just continuing to spiral on out of control. These places they really don't think they can pay the money back um, and there's one city mayor they talked to who they said the debt's about 24 billion now and it's envisioned to run into about 44 billion by the time they're finishing building all these projects and all that stuff you know all these workers building these new apartments can't afford any themselves uh, the Chinese you got to understand they've had it exceedingly hard for so many years during the early communist days, it's not just that, for the last hundreds of years, Chinese have had it so hard um, and been peasants for so long that now they've got money they save and they don't spend, so they don't consume any of their own stuff. Um, and they're trying to get them to consume their own stuff, but they're not willing to do it because they're so putting aside for a rainy day. Um, you know, they're so full on when it comes to saving and not consumption. Um, and the fact of the matter is they can't afford the stuff they're building. These people are living in old buildings from communist days that are probably built in who knows when, um, years and years old. Some of them I think are actually built in the 1800s or mid 1800s, old stone buildings and that. And they've got like five rooms, maybe six rooms, and a courtyard in the middle. And in each of these rooms around the courtyard, one family lives in a room. Now these five or six families between them have one sink, one cold water tap and a double ring gas burner and that's got to do the whole lot of them for all their needs. For bathing, for cooking, they're all got to argue the toss over that one tap and those two gas burner rings. Um, and you know this is the way these people are living. Um, you know but You've, you've got these crazy building projects uh, that just continue on. For instance, one of the worst places is Inner Mongolia. They've got a city of 100,000 people. Now, the one near me is like 200, 250,000 people. And so I know, like Koh Sabah, Troy was, that's 100,000 people. And this place has $14 billion worth of debt from building boom that is all like this is government, uh, local government debt is $14 billion from all these big projects they built, you know, big art gallery, big Blumen Stadium. And at one point in this documentary, they actually were in um, the place that was in, you know, trying to run up about $44 billion worth of debt. Um, and that place, they went to the football stadium there. And there was only one-tenth of the people in the stands that they could fit in the stands. One tenth of it was used, and all that, and another ninety percent of the seats were empty. You know, and here they were, you know, in another place, this in Mongolia, uh, where it's real crazy. Hundred thousand people have now got government debt of fourteen billion. They've got massive stadiums, massive blooming, you know, art galleries, this, that, and everything you can think of that a government would want to build. They got one, or two, or three. And yet they just don't have the funds to ever pay that sort of money back. Um, you know, and this is the thing. This is they believe the crash is going to be 2016, but a lot of these crashes they sort of manage to keep pushing along, push it along a little bit further. So it could be 2017, 2018. Um, but having said that, um, I hope to have that place or this place. Fingers crossed, paid off before all that goes down, um, and I'll be out of debt, hopefully. Um, but yeah, this is the thing. China's going down this whole building boom route, 
the feds are trying to stop it. They have actually gone around and jailed a whole stack of different mayors and whatnot. Uh, there's a saying they've got to uh, to kill the chicken to scare the monkey. And they're hoping that all these other local government people will slow up by jailing a whole stack of different mayors. They're trying to, you know, scare the other people to, to slow up with all this shadow banking and continuing to build everything. And but whether that actually works or not is another thing. Um, but yeah, just keep all this in mind um, that it ain't going to blow up and they don't think it's going to blow up real soon. But the Chinese are in a building boom that is absolutely unsustainable that they cannot pay back. And this was all in response to lack of selling cheap stuff and a whole stack of factories closing after the GFC. Uh, so all they've done is set the place up for another big crash. Uh, another thing too, a lot of these steel mills that are supplying all the steel for these buildings and whatnot are all running at a loss. There's only a handful of them making a very small profit, but most of them are running at a slight loss and are also running off credit. Um, how all this ends, I don't know, but I do hope that these workers who've saved up all this money and whatnot can actually buy some of these apartments or get a decent deal on, you know, credit-wise or whatever on some of these expensive apartments that they built. Um, you know, and there will still be the demand that their living standards don't drop and they still remain in a job, such as, you know, a lot of countries do. They never want to step back in their living standards. Um, and that itself will cause another kerfuffle when this collapse occurs that people will be pissed off they'll be out of work again, and that could be the end of communism in China. Um, you know, we'll have to see. Um, but, yeah, just keep that one on the back burner for a couple of years away, um, and I hope it sort of pans out for the better, but... <sighs> Apparently, it's going to make the GFC look like a bit of a, not a big deal. Um, and I think our arse will be getting very sore because all of a sudden we won't be selling the coal and steel to all these places that are running at slightly below cost to make the steel for all these buildings uh, because we are a major exporter of iron ore, coal and natural gas to China. And because the greenies are trying to kill the damn agricultural export industry, um, our one good industry left, although the agricultural export industry was fine and we don't have any subsidies, farm subsidies here, um, yeah, we may see the death of our mining industry pretty colossally. Um, not complete death, but it'll be a bit like after the GFC, except a lot worse where they put a whole stack of miners off and put a whole stack of mines into caretaker mode, um, whereby people just, you know, just have it in caretaker mode um, for the day when we may use it again. But anyway, I hope it doesn't turn out too badly, but we'll see when the shit hits the fan, and that's something I thought I should tell you all about.